Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danette Howard, and I am Senior Vice President and Chief Policy Officer at Lumina Foundation. And I am delighted to welcome the 1,200 of you that registered for this webinar to our Equity First Conversation with the amazing Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. Before we jump into our conversation with Dr. Kendi, I have just a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to review so that we can ensure that we have a smooth and easy flowing conversation today. First, we'll have a little time at the end of this session to address any questions from the audience. So please submit your questions in the chat at the bottom of your screen. The public chat has been disabled, but we'll be collecting all of your questions and we'll try to address as many as possible. Second, closed captioning services are available today. To enable captioning, turn on your CC closed caption option on the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. And finally, the webinar is being recorded and you can follow Lumina Foundation on Twitter to be made aware of when uh, the recording is released. So with that, uh, I'd like to read a little bit of uh, Dr. Kendi's extensive bio and then we will jump right into the conversation. Dr. Kendi is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor in the Humanities at Boston University and the founding director of the BU Center for Anti-Racist Research. He's the author of seven books, including Stamp from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, for which he became the youngest recipient ever of the National Book Award for Nonfiction in 2016. Uh, he now has four New York Times bestsellers, including How to Be an Anti-Racist, which we'll be discussing extensively today, and his latest book, which was just released, co-edited with Dr. Keisha Blaine, uh, is 400 Souls, A Community History of African America from 1619 to 2019. And Dr. Kendi, that book just debuted number one on the bestsellers list. And he dethroned President Obama's memoir from the number one spot. So you may be the only person, uh, Dr. Kendi, to have that claim to faith. First of all, I just want to say thank you for agreeing to be here with me today. And I am so excited for this conversation. Excited too. Thank you so much, Dr. Howard, for having me. Absolutely. So I have about three hours worth of questions for about 35 to 40 minutes. So um, I'm just going to dive right in. And I'd love to um, have you share a little bit with our audience about you know, your upbringing, your family, where you're from, and your writings. You speak about your mom and your dad and your brother. So can you just tell us a little bit about your childhood? Sure. So I uh, was born and raised in Jamaica, Queens, in, in New York City. And my, my parents uh, were and still are uh, uh, ministers. And you know, particularly my father, when, he, when I was growing up, my mother uh, uh, entered uh, into the ministry when I was in high school. Uh, and so in many ways, our lives revolved around the church, uh, the AME church uh, in particular. And my parents actually met during that during the era of black theology when mm. uh, black folks were saying apparently radical ideas like Jesus is black and, and the church should be a, a space of liberation. Uh, and so my parents certainly spoke about that uh, and, and, and spoke about our culture um, and spoke highly about, you know, about black people. And, but I actually, we, we moved to, Northern Virginia when I was in high school, yeah. uh, Manassas, Virginia. And so I went from this pretty much all black neighborhood to this mm -hmm. suburban majority white neighborhood in all places in Manassas, Virginia. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was near uh, this uh, Manassas Battlefield Park where many uh, neo-Confederates would come uh, mm -hmm. to relive the glories of the battles of Bull Run that the Confederacy won early in the Civil War. And my high school was named after uh, Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. Um, and uh, so in many ways, I was able to sort of understand the way race and racism operates from, from both types of worlds, at least 
uh, I can sort of reflect uh, on that. Yeah, thank you. And we'll come back to how some of your formative experiences influenced this journey that you've been on to ensure that we have a more just society. Uh, but I really wanna talk about the premise of your book, How to Become an Anti-Racist, which is that it is impossible to be not racist, you say, uh, that one can't be neutral when it comes to the plague of racism. Uh, uh, and this is a quote from your book, there is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist, it's anti-racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism, you say. So Dr. Kendi, for those who might be with us today who haven't read the entirety of your book, can you explain that basic premise that it is impossible to be not racist? You are either anti-racist or you are promoting and supporting racism. Sure, so we, we, we unfortunately, when we look out at our society, we, we see racial disparities and inequities all around us. We, 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 we see, you know, black and brown people disproportionately uh, incarcerated, you know, indigenous and black folks disproportionately dying of higher rates from COVID-19. We see all sorts of racial health disparities, even uh, well-educated black women being far more likely to die in pregnancy than, than white women uh, who haven't graduated high school. We, we, we see disparities in, in black folks dying at higher rates from from police, uh, we see Latinx immigrants being uh, considered, quote, aliens and, and immigrants from Europe being considered, quote, uh, Americans. We, we, we see all these disparities and this, these disparities, these, these uh, forms of degradation, this is the norm, you know, just as in 1850s, slavery was the norm. So in that, um, when you say, when a person says, you know, I personally am not upholding, I'm not doing anything. Um, what happens to that norm? That norms persists. Uh, and, and so in order to eliminate that norm, that norm of racism, we have to actively do so. And to actively do so is to, to be anti-racist, meaning you have people who are actively seeking to substantiate and maintain this system of racism. Then you have people who are like, who are just going about sort of their day as this normality persists. And then you have uh, people who obviously are actively challenging. And those folks who are, who are imagining this space of neutrality, what I'm trying to sort of say is, is just as it was in 1850, uh, just as it was in 1950, when you do nothing in the face of slavery and Jim Crow, it persists. And then you have a level of complicity uh, in its persistence. Or if someone is writhing on the ground in pain and you just walk on by, <laughs> when you can lay a hand, when you can help, when you can be a part of this larger struggle for equity and justice, you have a, you're complicit uh, in, their consistent, in their continued pain. Uh, and so to me, to be anti-racist, obviously, is to actively challenge the system of racism, while uh, to be racist is to essentially allow it, whether through action or interaction, to persist. Hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate your explanation of that, um, although I've, I've read a number of times um, your, your sentiments about it in the book. Um, but can you go a step further, Dr. Kendi, and situate that explanation and the rest of our conversation within the very moment that we now find ourselves? So here we are um, nearly a year since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Um, we know that while uh, everyone has been impacted by the pandemic, uh, people of color, black and brown people have been most adversely impacted, both in terms of being susceptible to the uh, virus, to succumbing to the virus, in terms of job loss, etc. cetera. Um, right next to the global pandemic, we're also coming up on nearly a year since George Floyd 
was killed. And the nation and indeed the world have had to really reckon with uh, the deep seated history um, of racism that has never been reconciled. So how have you, uh, given your life's work, try to uh, make sense of all of that, where we find ourselves? And how have you tried to help others make sense of it as you um, really are encouraging all of us to harness whatever power and privilege we have to move toward this more anti-racist world? Sure. So first, uh, uh, um, around this time last year, uh, and especially two weeks from now, around this time last year, you, you had many Americans, uh, too many Americans saying that COVID-19 was the great equalizer. Mm. Um, and, and the reason why people were able to say that is because there was no racial demographic data that was public. Mm. And by the end of the month, you had a county and a state, uh, and, and ultimately by mid-April, you had several states that had released racial demographic data showing that, that black and brown and in, indigenous people were being infected and, and, and killed at higher rates. And then at that point, and, and this is sort of how I make sense of it. And this is sort of the, the sort of conversation I'm trying to have with the American people. At that point, the, the next question was why? And, and I think that how we answer that why determines whether we're being racist or anti-racist. Mm -hmm. and, and so you had initially too many Americans saying, well, black people are getting infected and, and killed at high rates because they're not taking the coronavirus as seriously. They're not socially distancing. They have more pre-existing conditions because they eat bad food and they're so lazy and they don't exercise. In other words, black people are at fault. Personally, there's something wrong with them. That's why they're dying. And, and being infected at higher rates. And, and then of course, you had others who said, no, the problem isn't black people. The, the problem is our policies and practices. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that black folks are less likely to have access to health insurance, which means they're less likely to present with early stages of COVID. Uh, and when they do present, they have to go further away because they're less likely to live in neighborhoods with, with high quality healthcare. And then um, uh, part of the reason, another reason why they present later is because uh, they're, they're, they're more likely to live work in the service industry where it's harder to get time off. And because they work in the service industry, they're less able obviously to work from home, which is leading to more infections and then more deaths. And then when they do get infected because they're more likely to have pre-existing conditions, there have pre-existing conditions because they're more likely to live in neighborhoods with higher levels of air and water pollution. So then people started to see all these factors mm -hmm. that were based on the conditions that Black people were forced to live in that was actually the cause. And that's an, that those, are, those were the anti-racist explanations. Mm -hmm. In other words, there certainly were Black people not taking the coronavirus seriously, but there were white people too. And indeed, we started to look for different explanations when by the end of April, we had these predominantly white groups that were protesting to reopen states. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it shouldn't have came to that. Why couldn't we just, from the beginning, if there is a disparity, if there's an inequity for us to be like, okay, what can we change? What's going on with conditions and policies and practices and systems and structures? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and we're going to get to um, a question about the role of systemic policies in allowing systemic racism to continue. Um, but before we do that, Dr. Kendi, I um, want to talk about some of the um, early episodes in your life that you describe in your book. Um, would you say personify the fact that you had um, really internalized some of those racist messages that you had been exposed to and received during your early years and that in fact you had uh, perhaps even begun to perpetuate some of those racist 
thoughts and ideas. And um, this is something about which there has been a lot of discussion and even some controversy because uh, you go on to um, say that you had to undo that, that you yourself had to uh, learn how to be an anti-racist. So I guess I'd like to hear a little bit about some of those early experiences that you described uh, where maybe you were perpetuating some of those ideas and then what were the moments that set you on a path to doing this work around anti-racism? Well, so I, I came of age in the, in the 1990s as a, as, a, as a black youngster. And if there was ever a decade in American history where black youth were considered the American problem, were considered as, as, a, as a movie from the era uh, was named A Menace to Society. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the 1990s. That was the decade uh, when it was imagined that Black youth did not value education. So a no schools, no excuses schools movement, you know, emerged. That was the decade when Black youth were called super predators. That, that was the decade when, when, when Black uh, teenage girls in particular were, were told they were having too many babies because they were so lazy because they didn't, uh, because they wanted more welfare. That, that was the decade in which uh, Black youth who were listening to hip hop were being told that it was making us violent and hypersexual and that we needed to pull up our pants and our halter tops. You know, that was a decade in which Black youth were constantly being told we were the problem. <laughs> And if there was, you know, those ideas were circulating throughout society, but the people who were hearing them the most were black youth, like me. And so, you know, I, my How to Be an Anti-Racist opens with a speech that I gave in high school for an MLK competition, in which in many ways, many of those ideas that I had heard over the course of the 90s, I had inter I internalized them and then expressed them in this speech in which I went on and on about all the things that were wrong with black youth. And I made the case that it was that black youth were the problem, were, were America's racial problem, just as it had been taught to me, you know, all month long by, 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 by Democrats and Republicans, by white folks and black folks. Um, and, and that was the year 2000. And, and that November, I was a freshman in Tallahassee, Florida, at Florida a University. And, and for those of you who may not remember, you know, that was the election that came down to Florida. And, and many Black Floridians had their votes spoiled, uh, had trouble uh, voting, had all sorts of problems. And it was, of course, uh, you know, that was, when George W. Bush ended up winning the state by a few hundred votes and thereby the presidency. And so as a freshman at, in Tallahassee at, at, at FAMU, we were in a May at the center uh, you know, of that debate over that election. And I heard first and second and, and third hand stories of black folks who were trying to vote but were denied the ability to vote. And, and that living through that and seeing that set me on a path because I was like, well, maybe black folk are not the problem. Maybe something else is the problem. And, and so Dr. Kendi, your, your um, articulation of that story actually speaks to some of the controversy that I've read about um, your having to go on this journey of uh, becoming an anti-racist because the question is, doesn't one have to be in a position of power in order to uh, have to become an anti-racist. In other words, can people of color, black and brown people have to go through that process of becoming anti-racist? Because more likely than not, we are usually not in those positions of power to put policies in place, to uphold systemic racism. Um, I think I have something here where you even speak to that uh, in your book. Uh, it is racist power that creates the policies that cause inequities, you said. Mm -hmm. So help me reconcile um, the claim that anyone can be racist, yet not everyone is in these positions to perpetuate 
racist policies? No, that's, I'm happy you asked that because, so in, in How to Be an Anti-Racist, I try to break down uh, the sort of levels of power. And, you know, as you mentioned, there are the, the ultimate level of power is the policymaker, is, is the person who has the power to shape and break uh, and change policy. And, and, and obviously, Black folks and, and people of color more broadly mm -hmm. are underrepresented uh, in, a, in a massive way in, 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 in policymaking positions. And white folks are overrepresented in a massive way mm -hmm. in, in, in policymaking positions. And, and then you have policy management. So you have these middle managers who execute uh, uh, policies that other people create. Uh, and, and Black folks are more represented in those positions, but still underrepresented. But one of the things I wanted to focus on in the text, and I try to focus on in my work, is the other level of power, which is the power to resist. And, and I, I, you know, as an historian of African Americans, uh, as an historian of racism, you, you can't really tell that story without Black people uh, encouraging other Black people that we have the power to resist. <laughs> we have the power to resist slaveholders. We have the power to resist Jim Crow and how you have activists uh, coming into Black communities or emerging in Black communities, trying to convince other Black people we actually do have the power. And, and I'm mentioning this because uh, this idea that, 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 that people of color don't have power, uh, you know, I wrote about how, you know, how to be an anti-racist, how that actually reinforces racist power. Like that's what they want us to believe. Um, and the other issue I think is very important and I did not sort of explain this effectively in the book. Um, and I've been trying to make it up ever since. <laughs> is, is I think it's important for us to not use the term racist with a T and racism with an mm -hmm. M interchangeably. So when we think of the term racism, we're thinking it is essentially systemic, structural, and institutional. So when you when you you ask the question like, can can black people, as an example, um, do they have the power to execute racism? Uh, you know, I would say actually no. <laughs> that that actually you know, uh, uh, especially if we're talking about societally or nationwide. Now you have black people who have institutional power in certain institutions, uh, but, but generally speaking, nationally and certainly internationally, uh, you know, Black people don't have that, that power. But it's a different qu question when you're talking about racist with a T. So if racism is, is structural, racist is individual. So, so racist is individual uh, idea, individual policy, individual person. So the question isn't whether people of color have power. The question is, does Clarence Thomas have power? The, 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 the question is, does Daniel Cameron have power? The, the, the question does, is Tim Scott have power? The, the, the question is, does Ted Cruz have power? Those are completely different questions. And so then this individual, how are they using their power? Are they using it to uphold white supremacy and racism? Or are they using it to resist uh, racism? Yeah, thank you for, for disentangling that. I think we could spend a whole session just on that one concept, Dr. Kendi, racist and racism. And you do have a chapter in your book where you talk about beha the behavioral part of that, you know, and, and the um, individual nature of behavior um, versus the systematic and nature of the racism. So um, thank you. We're going to move on. Though. I wanna move us into a discussion about the work uh, of Lumina Foundation, which is expanding learning beyond high school. And we are committed to working with our partners and grantees to make sure that 
Everyone has access to high quality learning and the opportunity to earn a high quality credential that's going to mean something for them. So a certificate, a bachelor's degree, an associate degree, a certification of some sort. And we know that as a nation, we've made progress over time in increasing the rate of individuals in our nation who have those credentials. We also know though, when you look beneath the overall rate, there are significant differences, right? Uh, Dr. Kenny, I, I, you know this as well as anyone. Huge inequities, um, unjust and unfair outcomes by race and ethnicity. Now, some people call this the attainment gap. Uh, some people might refer to it as the achievement gap as they do many issues along the education continuum from pre-K through college. But you suggest that this should uh, instead be called an opportunity gap, right? Not an achievement gap, an opportunity gap. Can you say a little bit about that? So specifically, when we look at, let's say, test score differentials, between let's say black and, and brown students and, 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 and white and Asian students. And let's say if we're talking about SAT score uh, differences, for, for us to call uh, that an achievement gap mm -hmm. places the burden on the students and the test takers themselves. In other words, who's achieving and who's not achieving. When we reframe it as the opportunity gap, uh, then it, it, it became, comes more of a societal issue. So then it allow, it opens us up to say, well, why is it that, 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 that let's say if we're talking specifically about test score differentials, why is it that, you know, uh, white and Asian students are, are, are on average scoring at, at higher levels? What opportunities do they have that black and brown students don't? Oh, could it be that there's a multi- billion dollar test prep industry in this country? Uh, could it, and, and, and those test prep companies and tutors uh, market themselves uh, to families uh, as, as having the ability to boost one's test score? You know, could it be as studies have shown that those uh, test prep uh, uh, companies are concentrated in white and Asian neighborhoods? And, and so it makes sense that if they're, they're benefiting from that. Uh, could it be that uh, the schools uh, are on average more highly resourced uh, than the schools that, that black and brown students come to be? But because when we focus on, again, the achievement gap, it, it puts us down this road that, that I think many educators have been trying to get off of which is that the problem are those black students and brown students. And, and the reason why they're getting lower scores is because they don't wanna work as hard and that they come from broken schools with broken teachers and, and broken cultures and, and broken communities. And, and then we argue, educators then argue over whether they can be fixed. <laughs> so some are like, it's, it's impossible to fix those kids. And then others are like, oh, we can develop them and civilize them. Right, but what if all along the problem was opportunities? Yes, absolutely. And you know, we we see the tide shifting um, ever so incrementally as we are now having conversations about whether or not those standardized tests should be a part of the admissions process at all. Right. So um, the jury is still out on where we will land on that um, at some point in the future. But I did want to stay on higher ed for just a moment, Dr. Kendi. And you know, higher education is a major system, just like yeah. healthcare is a major system. And it therefore plays a role in either upholding the system that promotes uh, systemic racism or dismantling that system with great intentionality. Um, you are a part of the academy. Uh, where do you think we are as a field, higher education, in terms of our own anti-racist or anti-racism journey? And what can we do to accelerate our own work and help the nation move and indeed the world move toward becoming a more just society? So I, 
I think you sort of framed it brilliantly. I think when you opened this segment, when when you sort of you know talked about how indeed there are more uh, students of color who are in higher education, quote unquote, uh, or who've received uh, credentials, but they're disproportionately located in community colleges, in, um, in um, uh, 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 public, uh, uh, for the lack of a better term, lower tier institutions, uh, and significantly underrepresented in the quote, highly selective um, institutions. And uh, to me, and those uh, tiered institutions and community colleges are severely underfunded. And to me, that's the problem. <laughs> they're, in a, they're in that tier because of a lack of funding, <laughs> not because there's something wrong with them. Um, and, and so what, what, we, what we find is just like in the K through 12 system, generally speaking, the kids and the students who have the least in their homes uh, also tend to have the least in their schools. And those, those students, those college students who have the most in their homes on average tend to have the most in their colleges and, and universities. And, and, and then we wonder why we have, you know, as I'm starting to sort of call it, this, this sort of school to service industry pipeline. Uh, that more and more black and brown students are entering into even with college credentials, <laughs> right? Um, and, and so, but on the other hand, um, the, the access more broadly has never been better, but I think increasing access to the more highly selective or providing more resources to the institutions that are welcoming everyone, um, is, is absolutely critical in both areas. And I, I also thought of think that there has been an effort, I think among colleges and universities across the board to diversify their student bodies. And, and you know, there was a major push which many colleges began to sort of understand themselves as, as quote, diverse based on their student bodies. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to move past that to start thinking about the faculty bodies and the administrative bodies. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. to me, students are transient. The faculty and administrations are, are the ones that, that are more permanent. And so you have college and universities who've made tremendous strides diversifying their student body, but their faculty body and the administrative is still severely underrepresented. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and then they blame those black and brown faculty who aren't there um, for why they're not there, as opposed to their own policies and practices. Right, right. Well, you know, you, you just made so many um, fantastic points, Dr. Kendi, one of which is that when you look at uh, data uh, for faculty, certainly by rank, uh, over decades, there has been very little progress made in terms of having the faculty reflect America. Right. Um, another important point that I just want to underscore is your calling out instit key institutions, community colleges. I would add to that regional public comprehensive institutions, uh, MSIs, that are often underfunded but are more likely in many instances to serve as engines of opportunity for students who most need that support. So something that we are absolutely working on is uh, making sure that those institutions receive the funding so that they can well serve the students for whom they are that access point. But I wanna talk about another category of institution as well. And uh, in addition to coming of age in the 1990s, something that you and I have in common is that we are uh, both very proud graduates of different HBCUs. And so uh, I wanna give you a moment, uh, Dr. Kendi, to talk about um, your experience. You already mentioned FAMU, um, your alma mater, and what that experience um, did for you and what role did attending an HBCU um, play, uh, do you think, in you know, your doing this work now? Oh, well, it was absolutely sort of critical. And, and I, I think I'm happy you sort of lifted up the role of, of, 
of, of these types of institutions who are truly open and inclusive to, to, to all students and, 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 and how they can serve as pathways uh, to, to the student you know, finding a career path because that's precisely what FAMU did for me. You know, mm -hmm. I was a, I struggled in high school. Uh, I, I think I graduated high school with something like a 2.6 or seven GPA. Uh, I didn't get, you know, I think I barely got a thousand on the SAT. Uh, when I ended up applying to colleges, I was so fearful that I was not college material that I only applied to two institutions. And, and one of them of course was FAMU. And I was shocked uh, when FAMU admitted me um, and, and, and was willing to take me on as a project. Um, and, and, and what was striking is, you know, I ended up sort of graduating, um, you know, uh, magnum cum laude from, you know, from college after struggling in high school. And, mm -hmm. and it was because of the opportunities that I received this. Somebody gave me an opportunity, uh, you know, and, and, and I just don't think we emphasize enough how critically HBCUs are in uh, providing particularly black students uh, an opportunity, but not just providing them that opportunity, allowing them to see themselves in the curriculum, in, you know, in the environment, uh, and which then allows them to learn themselves, uh, you know, allow us consistently exposing them to black excellence, which then inspires them um, to be the best of themselves. Um, doesn't necessarily have to worry about being the only one in a classroom where when people are talking about slavery, because everybody's, you know, a lot of students are, you know, are, are black and then ultimately developing this pride, you know, in the institution that you will carry on. You know, it's like last night I was so uh, excited, like other Rattlers, when we saw someone by the name of LeBron James rocking a FAMU sneaker <laughs> in his game last night. So. Uh, you know, I mean, FAMU was everything for me. I'm, I'm not here if, if not for, for my HBCU. Um, I love that, Dr. Kendi. Thank you. And all my colleagues know uh, how much I love my HBCU as well, but that's not the topic of today's conversation. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm so pleased that uh, we are focusing on HBCUs, community colleges, um, regional comprehensives, those uh, engines of opportunity in our work at Lumina Foundation. So it's almost time to turn to audience questions, Dr. Kendi, but I'd like to talk a little bit about your center, the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University, and you know what you're hoping to accomplish at the center, let's say over the next one to two years. I know you have um, many ambitious projects. Do you want to talk to us about just a few of them? So, I mean, I think in, in a broad sense, we, we know that there are just so many incredible scholars uh, who are researching racism, and we want to provide mechanisms for them to translate their research into policy change, translate their research into narratives that, that can shift uh, public opinion, uh, and, and, and translate their research in a way that grassroots organizations can, can benefit. And, and one of the ways in which we're gonna be doing that initially uh, is by, we, we feel it's critically important to track uh, both racial data and, and the impact of, of policies. In, uh, in other words, you know, we've been collecting uh, racial demographic data from COVID-19 you know, since, since mid-April. And, and it's critically important for us to know in real time what the disparities are in, in Minnesota or in, in Washington or in Georgia. But it's also important for us to know, okay, what are the policies that could be causing these disparities that are causing these disparities? And because what this does, I think both this racial and race, racial data tracker and racial policy tracker that we're building in the areas of education and the economy and in criminal justice and others, is it allows people to see the problems of racial disparity, and then all the, also the policies uh, th that are causing them, which then allows us to see collectively the problem, 
which, which then becomes the platform, the foundation for us uh, working to build solutions. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kendi. We look forward to um, continuing to follow the amazing work that you and your colleagues are going to be doing at the center. And I want to turn now to a couple um, of the questions that have come in. We've gotten uh, far too many questions uh, uh, today than we'll be able to answer, but I do want to get to just a few. And I actually want to start with a question that I received in advance of today's session. I had the opportunity yet to spend some time yesterday with um, professionals across the state of Indiana who are focusing on equity and diversity work. And um, one of those individuals asked me to ask you this question. How do we respond to or deal with our white colleagues who after reading your book are relieved to read that black people can be racist too? How do we respond to them? Um, I think it, it's an indication that, that, that that they are likely not going to be the types of white colleagues who could aid us in the struggle uh, for, for equity and justice. So to me, it, it, it's an indication because, and that's what's striking, you know, with the book that you've had white folks uh, who somehow read the book and, and imagine that, that they are somehow off the hook. <laughs> and then you have other white folks who realize that they're on the hook even more than they originally thought. Uh, and that especially they, when they look in the mirror, they, they see a person who, who is on the hook and, and you have white folks recognizing the ways in which they've been racist and other white folks have been racist. But I think if, if, if someone sort of responds in that way, I mean, it's, it's, it's their new form of denial. And, and I talk about consistently how racism, how denial is the heartbeat you know, of racism. Yeah. No, that's right. Thank you, Dr. Kendi. Um, the next question comes from David Wilson, president of Morgan State University. He's also a Lumina board member. Um, Dr. Kendi, what would America look like as an anti-racist nation? What would be different and where would we feel those differences the most? Wow. So much would be different. Um, we would be the American people would not be afraid of black people and brown people. And as a result, we wouldn't have to spend, there, there would not be all that spending on policing and military and be more spending on education and public health uh, and housing. Uh, uh, so people would, you know, their schools, uh, you know, as an example, would, would, would would be similar to the schools that the super rich send their kids to near me in New England. Um, and, you know, there would be all sorts of uh, uh, efforts at, 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 and support for public health, um, which would then lead to potentially, when we look at the top 10 causes of health, uh, I should say death, they wouldn't all be almost all of them diseases. Um, and, because, and, 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 and America would not have such high rates of deaths from all of these diseases because we would have eliminated not just the racial health disparities, but we would have eliminated just these poor outcomes across the board, which are due to our refusal to truly invest in a 21st century health system. Because there's this belief that, oh, I don't want those black folks to, to, to receive better health care, so I'm going to forego it that like many pe white people think. Um, you know, fourthly, thirdly, um, we as a nation would, would really truly be able to, to see and appreciate just the difference. To me, the, the best aspect of this nation is the fact that we're a multiracial, multi-ethnic and multicultural society. And people would really be able to see that and, and feel that, and they would feel comfortable entering into different communities and learning about different cultures and ethnic groups and racial groups, and it would be supported. And, 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 and I think people would then be able to have a, a, you know, America would almost be like the human rainbow. And people would 
love that, you know, about this country, as opposed to the ways in which we are, are fearful or, or ignorant or, or, or imagine that difference is, 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 is worse than, than, than what we are. And it's, it's easy to see how far we have to go to get there, right? But do you see any indicators of progress? I mean, what do you see that suggests, Dr. Kendi, that we are moving in that direction, even if sometimes we take two steps back? What, um, what gives you hope that we can continue this good work and ultimately meet that aspirational goal? Well, I'd say three things. First, that last year, uh, some studies found that there was that we had the largest series of demonstrations uh, for any issue in American history. Uh, and I'm talking about, of course, the demonstrations that followed the, 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 the murders of, of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor. Uh, so that gives me hope. It, it certainly gives me hope that by June, one study found that 76% of Americans were saying that racism is a big problem in this country. Uh, it certainly gives me hope that the, uh, the president and vice president of this nation both stated that they uh, have plans to root out uh, uh, systemic racism. Um, now, will they actually do that? Will we be able to turn those demonstrations into actual policy change? Will people who are aware of racism be willing to support the policies that can actually eliminate it is not something that I know, um, but 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 I certainly see that as signs of, pro of, of hope. Thank you. Um, our next question, what advice do you have for student leaders who are beginning to learn and work towards social justice and change? So I think first, one of the things that it took me a long time to learn, and, and I find that this is, there was a time in my life, especially when I was a, a teenager, uh, that I didn't really care what anybody thought. You know, I was gonna dress how I wanted to dress. I was gonna act how I wanted to act. But then by the time I reached the latter part of my teenage years and entered into college, I started being concerned, let's say about what white people thought about me. And I, I started to be concerned even about what other sort of black people thought about me. I, I started to be concerned about whether I was representing the race well. And, 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 and that then caused me to regulate who I was and not allow me to truly be my full self. And because I felt this sort of weight of the race on my shoulders. And, and so what I would certainly say to young people is that as you sort of, there certainly is this weight that we all have to carry uh, to be anti-racist, to fight the sort of heaviness of racism, but we don't also uh, have to uh, restrict ourselves from being ourselves. And, and so, you know, none of us are race representatives. And if someone, if we have a bad day and, 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 and do something negatively and, and, a, and a white person sees that and then generalizes, see, that's the way black people are and their black people are so lazy. So that's why they, you know, shouldn't, we shouldn't do this or that. You know, who's the problem in that moment? That, that white person who is expressing that racist idea, not you. <laughs> Uh, you're being human <laughs> and, and, and black people should be allowed to be human, meaning to be human is to make mistakes. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, I just want to, I always encourage young people because I, I, the earlier we as human beings can feel comfortable in our own body to be ourselves, I think the better. Yeah, and Dr. Kenny, on, on the, um... Maybe it's the flip side of this. You know, there are there are many um, people um, and, and and some young white people in particular 
who are committed to the movement for social justice, but are terrified of making a mistake that is going to uh, cause someone to think that they are not committed, right? To cause someone to think that they are uh, that word racist that no one wants to be called. What advice do you have for those individuals, right? Who are just kind of paralyzed and, and therefore not harnessing um, that, that proactiveness that you discussed earlier that will have them lean into um, being anti-racist? Well, so, you know, let's say you, you take a, a, you know, a white person who, who is, is part of a, a racial justice organization. And there's, let's say there's many black folks in that, in that organization. And they're paralyzed, as you stated, by sort of doing something wrong. They want to present themselves as someone who's, who's committed to this sort of struggle. And they're fearful of, 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 of quote, making any mistakes. Let me, let me give two, two scenarios. First scenario, a person is so fearful about making a mistake when they say something that's racist and a black person in that org points it out as racist, because they're so fearful, they deny it. They're like, no, no, I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. White person too. They say the exact same thing. Another black person points it out. And they're like, you know what? That was a racist idea. You know what? I was being racist. You know what? I'm going to sort of seek to repair. Now, the black audience, who do you think they're going to truly believe is committed to this struggle? The person who is so concerned about making a mistake that when they do, they're going to deny it? Mm -hmm. Or the persons who's striving to not make mistakes, as we all are, but when they do, they admit it. Mm -hmm. They're going to, I think Black folks are, are going to see that second person who admits the times in which they're being racist uh, as, as, as more committed. And I say that to say, I think, you know, I would encourage white folks to be less worried mm -hmm. about making mistakes and more worried about denying when you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Kennedy, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. One question from the audience, and then I have a final question for you. So the audience question is, who are some of the authors, artists, uh, and thought leaders who have most influenced you and inspired your work? I mean, I think you can check it out in my- uh, Lots know, my of book people case. back there, yes. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of folks. Um, Many, 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 many people. And I mean, I'm, you know, certainly in I'm, I'm really inspired now by by the work of and, and really the 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 battle of Nicole Hannah Jones. Um, you know, I've been inspired, of course, for a while by by scholars like uh, you know, Imani Perry or or Cornell West or, or Dorothy Roberts or Kimberly Crenshaw. You know, I'm inspired by activists uh, like uh, Alicia Garza, I'm inspired by lawyers like Brian Stevenson and uh, Cheryl and Eiffel and, and Michelle Alexander. And, you know, I'm, I mean, there's just so many incredible people who are doing great work right now who are consistently inspiring me. Thank you. So our final question um, for this afternoon, Dr. Kendi, I was going to ask you um, what gives you hope in this moment? but you already addressed that. So um, for all of the people who are still on the webinar with us today, um, what is your call to action for us in this moment? I think for each of us to, to think about what do we have to give to this larger struggle for, for racial justice. So some of us are, we're in a position in which that's what we do on a daily basis. And, but for those of, for those of you who are aren't, you know, the question is, you know, what do you have to give? You know, how can I support those local or national or statewide organizations um, and entities and institutes and, 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 and centers and, and, and nonprofits and, and, and political leaders and uh, who, who are fighting for racial justice? You know, can I volunteer for those organizations? Can I provide my expertise? You know, can I... Uh, support them 
you know, financially, like, what do I have to give? And, and I think, you know, I, I want people to think about that. And then also think about, what am I passionate about? You know, am I passionate about education? Okay, what, what part of education? Am I passionate about higher education? Am I passionate about higher education in Georgia? Uh, what aspect of higher education? And, and the reason I'm asking this is because chances are there are entities that are fighting for equity in the specific area that you're passionate about. So then you can go and support them, you know, in their efforts. That's right, Dr. Kennedy. We can all do something. We just mm -hmm. have to figure out what that something is. Dr. Kendi, I want to um, express a heartfelt thank you for joining me today for this far reaching conversation. Uh, as I said, I think we could have easily gone for another hour, but we did cover a lot of ground. So thank you so much on behalf of Lumina Foundation. And to our uh, audience, thank you for joining us today. To learn more about Dr. Kindy's work and the BU Center for Anti-Racist Research, you can follow them on Twitter at Anti-Racism Center. And you can follow us at Lumina Foundation uh, and our Twitter handle is at Lumina Found. So thanks so much for joining us and we will be uh, letting you know via Twitter when today's recording is available. Have a wonderful afternoon.